So what I wanted to do this part, I wanted to make sure that I had enough time, is, uh, is open it up to you guys. And let's explore how we can be a three-dimensional instructor in your school with students that maybe are giving you challenges. So does anybody have a student or would like to start it off? Yes, sir. What's your name? Terrell. Terrell. Terrell asked a very good question, and we all have this experience in class. I know that uh, nobody here does not have a student that interrupts all the time, wants to raise their hand all the time. Particularly, the younger you go, the more they interrupt, correct? So let's say that um, usually in the 7 and up class, do we get that a lot? In the 7 and 12-year-old, do you get that as well? The 7 and up class, the reason why they're interrupting all the time is mostly just because they've been trained and allowed to do that. They're probably, their mom or dad is probably a know-it-all, very, very smart, um, always has an opinion to say. So when they're doing it, they're doing it more of a social reason why I'm doing it. I want you to know how smart I am. When we're talking about six and under, it's not, smo it's not as much social as it is intellectual. Uh, they want you to know how smart they are, but not because they want you to like them. They just r are recognizing how smart they are personally. So, for example, like in a five and six year old class, if you're saying, all right, we're going to stand really strong like dinosaurs, and one kid goes, dinosaurs, I have a dinosaur coloring book at home, and I have dinosaur pajamas, and I just want the dinosaur world, right? And they interrupt. So you want to make sure, number one, you understand why they're doing it. But the tips that you want to do is, number one, is always making sure that you're prompting good behavior. So you always say, okay, remember, when I talk, the first thing I want everybody to do is sit with your legs crossed, hands on your knees. Now, if you do have a question, when I give you a break, then you can come up and ask the question, but let's make sure that nobody's talking while I'm talking. So if somebody is, that's one way to prompt it. Uh, another way is when they raise their hand, then you say, okay, you got 10 seconds to say what you got to say. Ready? And then they get it out, and you go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, good. And then reroute it because you never want to downplay the reason why they're doing it. Uh, I would have to say with students that interrupt you all the time, that is probably the place where I become more patient and more accepting to their behavior because we all have it, correct? And raise your hand if you have the kids who interrupt. We all do, right? And one of the things that I think uh, – I remember when I was a little girl, a uh, younger girl, I shouldn't say little girl because <laughs> I'm still very small. I remember Mrs. Kleinschmidt in the third grade, and I've told this story before. Mrs. Kleinschmidt's like, all right, this weekend is Easter. We have Easter vacation. And I was in the back going, ooh, 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 ooh. And she's like, yes, Melody, what? And I said, my brother's birthday's on Easter. I was so excited. I was wanting everybody to know. She said, like, you think we all care that your brother's birthday's on Easter? Uh, and I, I tell you, I remember this. This is third grade. I'm 35 years old. So this is um, 25 years ago. Wait, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, probably, this was over 20 years ago, and I still remember her saying that. And I remember how it made me feel. And I barely talked for the rest of the year. And I was embarrassed, and I was ashamed. So you got to think about that. When kids are interrupting you and they're doing those things, they're not doing it to disrespect you. That's the most important thing you got to remember. They're doing it because they either want to relate to you and be your friend and share their life with you, or because they want to, they're realizing, wow, I'm smart. I know dinosaur outside of the school, and you're saying dinosaur, and I'm putting them together. This is really cool. So you can be a little bit more patient with them. Give them a chance to say something, but if they're the students that have, they, it takes them a long time to get the story out, or if they can go on and on and on, say, all right, Terrell, I know you have something to say today. Like, Razzie always has something to say, correct, Jill? Uh, you got 10 seconds to say what you got to say because we're running out of time and we have dodgeball. So you can be a little bit patient on the students as long as they're not distracting with negativity. Distracting, saying, excuse me, Master Melody, Miss Jill's hitting me. Excuse me, Master Melody, he's bothering me. That's where you would want to remove them from the classroom, bring them into the office and say, look, Please keep your tattling down to a minimum because what it does is it takes away from the fun in the class. And if you're always telling on, on everybody, then we're not having fun, right? Do you have fun when somebody tells on you? No. Do you think they have fun when you're telling on them? No. So again, being patient and being a little bit more understanding will help you become more three-dimensional. Does that answer your question? Yes. So, yeah, Gabriel's, you know, attention is very lacking. He's four years old. So how do you time that? Um, how do you... You know, what kind of time do you use to see the progression or, you know, what do you have to, you know, use as timelines? It's for, for the progression of each, it's going to vary depending on the individual. What you want to do is look at the bigger picture. What, what age, you have, if he's a four-year-old, um, what age groups do you have in that class? Well, it, it goes from, you know, four all the way up to 12. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, and and that, but, okay, go ahead. Yeah, and there's four-year-olds that have that, the focus that 
but for Gabriel's, I'm totally unfocused. Yes, we all have we all have the sharpshooters, the four year olds that do really well. But you got to remember when you have four to twelve year olds in the same class, the, most of the drills that you have to do are, are catering to the twelve year olds because if they're too easy, the twelve year olds are going to get bored, right? So you're right. writing these really complicated drills for your older kids to pick up, and Gabe's just not able to get it. It's because it's not his stage of development. So it might not necessarily be Gabe. It could be just the the, the curriculum is too advanced for him. Even though you have some four year olds that are sharpshooters, I have a two two and a half year old that runs circles around half my school she's just a rock star um, but you can't compare him to the other four-year-olds in that type of environment so your options are number one pull him out and put him in private lessons or break up your classes a little bit more which is ideally what I would recommend because if you're running drills that are easy enough and challenging enough for the 12 the, your 10 11 12 year olds which is probably your biggest numbers in the class it's not gonna be easy for the three and four or four and five and six year olds they're gonna not be able to keep up so then you slow the drills down and then the 12 year olds get bored and then you speed it up and you're running what's called the roller coaster class. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, so you might want, my suggestion is not, maybe not look at the kid but look at the curriculum and say, all right, maybe I should put my four, five, six year olds, maybe even seven year olds in their own class and then have the other ones if you have the time to do that. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Um, so I have a problem with a lot of my students when their parents are in class. It's not so much when their parents aren't there, they oh. are fantastic, wonderful. Mm -hmm brilliant children and then when their mom and dad are there they're absolutely insane and I'm not really sure how to deal with that <laughs> I mean they do what they're supposed to when mom isn't sitting there watching but as soon as mom's there in class they'll just keep running back to her off the floor no matter how many times we talk because about they them. don't want mom and dad to know that they can follow directions <laughs> that's exactly what it is because at home I never listened all the time that's why I got put in martial arts in the first place because I never listened so in martial arts I started listening because I loved it but when my mom was there, I think I did it too. I didn't listen because I didn't want mom to go, oh, what, really? You're going to listen for Mr. Bright, but you're not going to listen for, to me, huh? I see how it is. Uh, in that particular situation, number one, what you want to do is you want to get the parents involved. So if the parent is there and the kids are overacting, um, which is what it is, or underacting maybe in some situations, is prompt them to do things good. So do like little challenge things that are very easy. If they're overacting and in between the drills, say, okay, when I say go, when everybody to sit down, legs cross, hands on their knees as strong as they can. Ready, go. And then the ones whose moms and dads are there, point out how well they're sitting, if they are sitting. And if they're not, you have to try to prompt it and pull it out of them. And then go over to mom and dad and go, mom, dad, you see how awesome they are? I'm so proud of them. They're trying really hard and kind of turn the tables around and let them see how it feels to have mom and dad proud of them because they have this anxiety. Remember, kids have worse anxiety than we do. They just don't know how to express their anxiety. You know, for example, they're like right before we got started here today and everybody started coming in, my heart started racing a little bit, going, oh, okay, you gotta breathe, you gotta get up, you have to speak, make sure that you don't say anything stupid or make sure you don't trip, you're in heels, you're usually barefoot, you know, you have all these things. But I know how to coach myself internally. Kids don't. So they have anxiety when they have to perform at testing, they have anxiety when mom and dad are watching, but they don't know why they have anxiety, they just know that there's this pressure. So the only way to deal with anxiety is by to act crazy and act nuts and act silly, which is what typical teenage girls do too, right? When they have anxiety around boys, act silly, and vice versa, boys, teenage boys, when they're around girls, they have anxiety, their hearts are beating, and they just kind of act like a bonehead because they don't know how to handle it. So again, just trying to connect them both, getting the parent to be proud of the kid and pointing out to the kid, doesn't it feel good to have mom and dad so proud of you? That right there will work really well, and that's part of being a three-dimensional instructor. Okay, other questions? Don't be afraid to speak into the microphone. Yes, sir. I got a, a, another question. How do you deal with the student that's on the other side of the spectrum? That's <laughs> totally, you know, outstanding, and now they're starting to lose a little bit of interest. Um, how, how do you deal with that student? This is a very good question. This is a fantastic question. I'm sorry, what's your name? Pedro. Pedro? Pedro had a very good question. He goes, so now how do we do with the kids on the other side of the spectrum? I'm starting to learn how to do this as well because we have so many sharpshooters that at first you're, you're praising them, praising them, praising them. This kid's great. He's fantastic. Every day it's, it's the... Um, the Carson show. I have a Carson who's just awesome and I'm always Carson this, Carson that. But then as Carson's getting to the higher ranks, you're like, you know what? I've given him so much praise. I don't want to boost his ego. So let me pull back from complimenting him so much to the point where now he's not getting all those compliments anymore. It's expected that he does really good. That's the worst thing that you can do. 
for those sharp students. And this is, is it's, it's a process. It's nothing that you can recorrect tomorrow. This is what you have to remember. When you have those sharpshooters at the very beginning of your program, compliment them, but limit the praise that you have. I have to try, constantly tell myself, he's awesome, but I don't want to keep going over there and doing that because I know as he goes through the ranks, I have to keep it up. So you got to remember, to, you got to keep up with the Joneses is basically what it is. So try to reserve the constant praise. That's why we don't give out student of the cycle um, in our school until after they've been in the program for at least eight months. Because if we give it away right away, um, then it's gonna be retroactive. So number one, limit the amount of praise at the beginning and slowly work your way through. Or number two, if you constantly praise them, remember if you give them constant praise and constant recognition at the very beginning, you have to do it all the time. You have to keep up with the Joneses to make them feel better. Or number three, consider an early advancement into the next program. Uh, which is something that we do. So we have some sharpshooters in our class that just do so well, we move them into the next age group. Um, in your particular situation right now, since you don't have the age appropriate programs, that gives you something to look forward to if you do make that transition. Then you can say, now my sharpshooter four year olds who could keep up with the other kids, I'm going to put them in that particular program to make them feel better. Um, that's one thing. Another thing is we have a perfect score award that we do in our school um, for testings. So if you score perfect on all eight skills, you get a special trophy with your name on it. So we have some students that constantly are earning perfect scores, so they're constantly getting that recognition as well uh, based on their performance in classes. So there's many different little strategies that you can do. It's just once you start, you have to keep going with it and follow through. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, when a child is not motivated, it is either A, your curriculum, B, it is the instructor, or C, it is the parent. So you want to find out who is, who, where, you know, where is it coming from. If the child, is, if the child is, is really good in the martial arts, but they're not motivated to come every day, they're probably not being challenged. So you may want to look at your curriculum and step it up another level for them, make sure that it's, it's targeting their specific needs. Um, if the child, if the curriculum's really good and the child does really great in class because he's got natural skills, but he doesn't have a good relationship with the instructor, that will affect the motivation of the student. Let's touch on that for a second before we go on to the parents. This is something that I have been working with my staff on intensely for the last three years because we all, uh, if you're a school owner here, you know that when you leave your school, you go like this, right? I do that. I had to go to Australia last year for two whole weeks, and I was like this the entire time, hoping that the school didn't burn down and it didn't fall apart too badly so that when I came back, uh, I can refix everything. And now I'm getting to the point where I want to systematize my school so that whether I'm there or another instructor is running class, the same thing is done. So we've accomplished that. But now the next step is having my instructors build the relationships that I have with my students. The reason why a lot of my students may lose motivation is because they don't relate to the other instructors. And the same thing. You may be a fantastic instructor and they love you, but if you have another instructor running class all the time and they don't have a relationship with them, they're going to lose motivation. Am I correct? So the role, especially for the new instructors, your role is to build relationships with those kids. Now, how do you build relationships with those kids? Simple. Just by communicating with them, playing with them before class, asking them how your day was, give me five, moving it out of the way, walking by, taking them down, throwing them on the ground, just messing with them, you know, uh, fake punches to their stomach, you know, uh, having them punch your hand. Let me see how strong that punch is. Any little thing that you can do to be the bigger brother or the bigger sister to them. And that's what I've been working with specifically with Mr. Andrew, who's one of our head instructors now, is you need to be every kid's big brother. But you need to be the big brother that everybody wants to have. I have a really cool big brother. I love my big brother. I look up to him. I think he's a genius. He's a little bit lazy, but I still love him for who he is because he's always been very nice to me. And he's always stopped to take the time if I had questions about my homework or if I wanted to play with his GI Joes, he would let me borrow his toys. He was a cool big brother. So go to your instructors. Make sure that your instructors have relationships with those kids. And uh, if your instructors have great relationships with the kids and your curriculum's really good, and the kid's still losing motivation, that's not internal, that's external. 
So that could be just the stresses outside of the school. And it could be many things. It could be the parent overbooked and overworked and going, ah, oh, all right, I got to take you to martial arts. Hurry up, get all your stuff ready. We need to go. We're running late. And the parent is consistently stressing about getting to martial arts and going, oh, we can't do this because you have martial arts. And using that against them, not realizing that it's triggering this anxiety, they will lose motivation. I remember my mother used to get frustrated having to take me back and forth to martial arts because a long time ago, I started in the ATA. In 1987 and my instructor pulled his school out of the ATA and uh, started his own system so my mother had to drive an hour and 45 minutes to another martial ATA school so that we can stay in the ATA because I wanted to be and that's how loyal I was and she used to make me feel guilty about it all the time all right we got to drive we got to go this is long I can't do this I can't do that and it made me not want to go anymore so in that particular situation again ask yourself is it your curriculum is it the instructor and if it isn't, then when the parent says, my child's not motivated, and you ask them, uh, is, is coming to school added stress for your child? Uh, are you rushing all the time? Uh, is he going from one activity to the next? Because that will affect his motivation as well. OK, other question. How am I doing on time, John? How, many, how, many, much, how much more time do I have? Uh, let's, let's get like 10. Ten more minutes. Perfect. OK, yes, sir, and then I'll get to you next, Terry. I understood you to say that uh, you involved the parents in yes. the teaching process. Um, I've, I've never done that. Okay. And, um, exactly how do you do it and how do you keep the parents from taking over the program? <laughs> Beat them up, Tom. You're strong. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is a very good question. What's your name, sir? Uh, Julius Baker. Julius, thank you very much for asking this yeah. question because this is a very good question. This is my social networking, is the parents. This is where I'm really good. I'm really good at building relationships with the parents because I 100% love my job. I feel, you've heard me end my speech a lot of times with the best job in the world is being a parent, right? There's nothing cooler than raising somebody and teaching them and showing them the way of life. Uh, the second best job is being a teacher, helping people become smarter. And the third best job is being an entertainer. Anything, anybody who entertains you to excite you and help you forget about your problems, whether it's a musician or artist. And we kind of have all three. We're parents, we're teachers, and we're entertainers all mixed in. So as a parent, proud parent of a chihuahua, I can relate to other parents and say, look, I know what it's like to be a parent. Um, so I, I get my parents involved just as much as I get the student involved. Like I said, this is my social networking. So when the parents, when the students come in, I'm talking to the students and I'm talking to the parents. I know all the parents by first name. I encourage the parents to come to the class, watch the class. During the classes when their child's are doing, children are doing good, I always look over at the parents because we have an open seating and get the parents involved, get the parents clapping, telling mom, did you see how awesome that was? If the parent isn't there when they come show up, I'll say, look, Gabe did a very good job today. He didn't distract anybody. Let's keep supporting him. So everything that I can do to constantly bring value to our program and make us feel like family, I get my parents involved. Uh, when I see challenges within my school, I bring the parents in my office. I'm in my office constantly talking with the parents, trying to help my children get a better edge in life. So I am heavily involved with the parents, but again, that's my social networking. That's how I grow my school is by keeping that relationship. There are a lot of people who do not want to take that extra time, not because they don't like the parents, it's just that that's not their area of specialty. So you can get your parents as involved as you possibly can, and it's going to help grow your school, or you can keep your parents you know, behind the curtain, and maybe they'll stay with you, maybe they won't, but the minute something triggers that child to not want to do martial arts, if the parent doesn't have your back, they're going to pull their child out. I don't, know if I, said that, I don't know if I said that correctly, but you know, who makes the decision on whether or not the child stays in martial arts, the child or the parent? The child. Don't ever, let, don't ever let anybody tell you that the parent makes that decision. No. Because if mom looks at Charlie and says, all right, we've got to pull you out of martial arts, and Charlie goes, but I love martial arts. That's my thing. You can't do it. The parent will, if, even if it's financial, the parent will find something else, make that sacrifice. During the recession that we had, we didn't lose students because the parents made cuts somewhere else because... We have such good relationships with the children, but also because we have good relationships with the parents, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes. Right. I understand that, but I mean the, the actual teaching process when you actually have them on the floor. Do work. you have your parents, are your parents open to, to they, the class? They are there, but I, I hardly ever allow them to, um, you know, give feedback while I'm teaching. Well, I don't allow them to give feedback. What I do is I give them feedback. 
So when their children are doing good in class, and I'll, I'll do a drill, and I'll say, and then maybe the children are struggling, or maybe the children are doing really well, I'll stop for a second and go, parents, the reason why we're doing this particular game right here, the one, two, three, ninja freeze, is helping them build their reaction time, helping them build their control. So watch your child. Watch how quickly your child can react. Watch how your child is standing still right now. This is really good stuff. So doing those types of things, it, it, you know, you're almost like marketing your program while you're doing it. And don't be afraid to do that, especially if you're 100% back your program, you're very confident about it, your parents will start to get involved. That okay, great. Way. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Hi, Melody. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, on motivation issues with uh, high achieving kids. Okay. Uh, sometimes I have some young kids who are doing so well, they get promoted to a place where they're moved into an age group or a class that's challenging for them technically, but emotionally they're really not ready for the kind of class they're in. Okay. And so how do you manage that? That's a very good question, Terry. I like that you're, I, you're being three-dimensional now. So now what you're saying is physically, yes, they are, but emotionally, they are not. This is where you have, that's, it, just because they're physically ready to go into the next class doesn't mean that you should. Carson would be a good example of that. Um, Carson is one of my five and six-year-olds. He's gotten, what do you say, Jill, about six perfect scores in a row. He has about, two, he has two more belts to graduate in our five and six-year-old program before he moves up. And his mom asks, you know, he doesn't turn seven until the end of the summer, but, you know, he's nailing this curriculum. Can we move him up? Carson was one of them where I said, no, he's not quite ready for that class because the seven to nine year old um, class is approached a little bit more maturely. And one of the reasons why Carson excels so much is because we play so much in class and he loves to play and um, there's less play. So I sat Carson down and said, look, you know, this next class, you're gonna learn new martial arts, which are gonna be fun, but we don't play as much. So if you wanna stay here and just keep playing and then get your white black belt and graduate this program, I think that'll be better for you since you're already at the top of your game and there's no sense in trying to change it up right now while you're having such a good time. So you do have to be careful and make that big decision. Being a three-dimensional instructor, say, they're smart, I wanna keep them motivated. And if they are motivated, sometimes we may overlook it. We may say, you know what, because they're getting perfect scores, because they're nailing the curriculum, time to challenge them, no. If your curriculum's really good, everybody should be nailing the curriculum and should be doing really well. Our last testing, we gave away, can you just think on the top of your head how many perfect scores we gave away last testing? 21. We gave away 21 perfect tr score trophies, which means our curriculum's going really good. It's on point. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing to keep them in that class. I hope I didn't contradict myself when I said if they're not being challenged, move them up. Because three-dimensional instructors will say if, it, if they're not emotionally ready for it, then don't do it keep them in that class, um, maybe even put them in more of a leadership role, like I do with Carson. So now when um, our classes are growing, they're getting really big. I've got a really, really good storm team, but for example, in the advanced group, when they're running through their advanced material, I always overlook the advanced and I test them for their skill stripes. I'll say, all right, Carson, what I want you to do is I want you to run it as if you're the instructor, since you're doing so well in this curriculum, and let him have all the other students run through their skills. So you can maybe do like a pre-storm team type of training with that particular kid. Does that help? Okay. Thank all you, right. Melody. You're welcome. Other questions? My name is Felipe. I'm from Gracie Barra in Dana Point and San Clemente. Um, I think one of the hardest um, ages to work with are the juniors uh, from, you know, 10 years old to 14. Okay. I think there's just uh, too much going on and starting on that age for them. So what kind of a special advices would you give uh, uh, to us uh, to work on that age group? Okay. When you say juniors, I'm always thinking of the three and four and five and six because we're in a different market. So you're working primarily with adults and your 10 to 14 year olds as your group that you're having our time with. You got to remember that even though that age group is extremely intelligent and we all know, right, 10 to 14 year olds are smarter than us. Does everybody know that? Just in case you didn't get there, you smarter than the fifth grade phenomenon that's a franchise in plenty of countries. Those kids are smarter than us. And the reason why is because just like uh, you probably, you're a lot stronger than the average guy your age because you're training every single day on your, your, your material. They're training every single day in school, so they are super, super smart. But just because they are super, super smart does not mean that they like to go to school all day and learn comprehensive material, then come into your, your gym and train just as intensely as your adults. They need to play still, so they need a little bit more fun. So my best suggestion for your 10 to 14 year olds is to incorporate a lot more fun games where they can be a little bit immature, maybe a little bit silly, 
maybe be a little bit more independent. They're still trying to find their identity. Their identity is not the serious um, MMA type of training that a lot of your adults are probably focused on, conditioning my body, conditioning my mind, conditioning my emotions. They're not at that stage of development yet, and they probably won't be for a very long time. Sure, you may get one or two of that mindset, but across the board, you're not. They want to come into your place because they want to have fun. They want to have a good time. Your martial arts is super cool, and they think it's cool, but if you're training too intensely, then they're gonna, you're going to lose their interest. So I have tons of games that we do, because we just did jiu-jitsu um, with our black belts, and they loved it. All the different games that we do, we play, they absolutely love them. So if you would like, um, if we get a chance, I'll bring you to the side, and I'll just maybe show you some of the games. You probably have some really good games, but it needs to be and the 10 to 14 year old class, we're just starting to um, embrace this a little bit more. We're doing about 60% games, 40% actual training with them. And uh, I, some of you may be going, all right, I don't want to play with them. I don't want to play with my teens, my preteens and teens, but they absolutely need it. They need it because they're in that social and emotional stage of development where they are fiercely loyal to their friends and they are fiercely loyal to status quo and they're fiercely loyal to anything that's going to make them cooler. So if you try to force it onto them, they're going to resist. They're absolutely going to resist. So like I said, just because they're physically talented and intellectually talented, they are the opposite socially and emotionally. They're actually, they're going, they're going forward with their physical and intellectual stage of development compared to younger kids, but they're going backwards with their social and emotional stage of development. Now they're insecure. Now they get very shy. Now they hold back and withdraw and worry about what other people think. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. Eventually it comes back full circle, but it's going to be a while. Does that answer your question? You're welcome. Hi, Melly. My name is Jason Cortez from Manteca, California. I, I had a quick question, uh, and it was something what, what you were saying uh, about uh, uh, the parents interjecting. You want to, uh, you're actually, when you're teaching the class, you're actually kind of teaching the parents as well. But uh, I, I'm, uh, how do you say it in a nice way when the parents are trying to teach the kids as you're instructing? I, I want them to shut up. <laughs> you know, I have a big sign, you know, you know c concentration is important for the, for what, the kids. What did, I, what did I tell Kelly two weeks ago? Kelly, you were, do you remember what I said to her when she was yelling across the mat to Blake? Yeah. I said, don't be that parent. Or I'm teaching, she's like, Blake, make sure you're sitting still. Blake, pay attention. I said, Kelly, don't be that parent. She goes, what parent? I said, the parent that yells across the mat and tries to hover over what I'm trying to do. I said, trust me, I know what I'm doing, <laughs> and I, I will. So I will go to that parent, and I'll say it in a joking way. Say it like that. Yeah, that's the best, that's the best way to do it. Joking way, then. Yeah, yeah, or serious. Yeah. You know? All yeah. you have to do is you just have to turn it around. If you sugarcoat it, then they're going to know you're intimidated. I'm not intimidated by parents. I have a parent that, that coaches from the outside of the dojo. <sighs> in... in when they're on the mat, you know? Don't you love those guys? Yeah. You know, and, and, and I like this question because we all have them and everybody's laughing. And for a while, I wasn't very confident with myself, my teaching skills. So I would try to be nice to the parent and sugarcoat it. Right now, we have our A game. I am confident about our curriculums. I am confident about our school. So I'm very confident I know what I can do almost better than you as a parent. I know a lot more about child psychology than you do. So I confidently can say, don't be that parent that hovers or that yells across the mat because, believe it or not, it's embarrassing your child and it's embarrassing you, um, and it might be embarrassing some of the other people around you as well because they're embarrassed for you. <laughs> and, and I'll say it just like that and laugh. I don't know if that answers the question the best way. It's probably not the best advice, but that, that's the honest advice that I can give you. Well, Kelly, Kelly, yes, and Kelly, Kelly, um, the lady I was talking about, her son's my godchild. <laughs> so, she, you know, she was at our house for Easter, and she thinks because she's friends, you're exactly right. She's yelling across the mat, and I, that's why I'm saying don't be that parent, that when you walk in the door, I go, oh, man, Kelly's here today. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, Master Melody. I have a question. My name is Mario from Caesar Kai Karate, New Jersey, and um, I've been teaching for almost 13 years now, and I'm seeing something in our school that I've never seen before and I don't know quite how to deal with. Our teenager beginners class, it's like 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds, are having issues with sparring. They're getting scared with sparring. They don't want to get hit. And I've never encountered that before. I always imagine that age group to like love sparring, hitting each other, getting hit, and never being scared. And I think it's affecting the environment of the class. How do you think the best way to deal with that would be? Well, you blame it on the media. <laughs> 
Blame it on the media. Blame it on all the everything that puts the fear of God into kids. The bullying, you know, the should I allow my child to do Facebook or not because of the one um, Phoebe Prince who committed suicide because of all the bullying. Yes, we are not in the same generation as we were 13 years ago. The minute, unfortunately, the internet started to become popular and we had all these tools and it, children that age are smart enough and have the intellectual access to so many things, they are unfortunately rebranded. The teenage mindset is very rebranded compared to where we were a decade ago, two decades ago, and that's where we can relate back to the, the Gracie School as well. You know, when we were younger, I would have to do knuckle push-ups on the ground when I wasn't paying attention. My teacher used to beat our legs with sticks, and we'd have to lay in dead cockroach position if we weren't paying attention. You can't do that anymore because it's bullying, and it's harassment, and you got lawsuits, and they listen to their parents say, well, if anybody ever touches you, I'm going to sue, or if your teacher ever calls you an idiot in class, I'm going to go to the school board. Next thing you know, it's on CNN that this teacher called their kid an idiot in class. So we have to be very careful um, with those particular situations. So yes, sparring is one of those situations where you're going to see the children revert. So the best way to change that, we've noticed um, we don't do as much free sparring anymore. We do games. So we do like spar wars, we do little point tag games, things like that to make it a little bit more fun so that they don't realize that they're actually learning how to spar, they're actually playing and it's more fun versus let's see who's stronger than the other, let's see who can beat the other one up first because they're so branded on that. So you do have to redirect some of the things that you're teaching right now to try to focus on ways that avoid that bullying and intimidation and focus on, on it being more fun and entertaining. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have for questions right now. But again, at the end of the day, there'll be a general Q&A. And if you have any more questions for Melody, you can certainly ask them then. So at this time, I would like to thank the CEO of Schumann Concepts and conceptsforkids.com, Melody Schumann.